Who is responsible for your actions, for the life you live, for your eternal soul? It's you, isn't it? You're the responsible one. If you notice the sign when you came in on the screens, no single drop of water thinks that it's responsible for the flood. All of us are responsible for our lives and the things that we create in our life. And it takes one more drop to call it a flood. And that's the way life is from time to time. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. You know, each and every one of us needs to meet our responsibilities as we run across them. Ecclesiastes 12 verses 13 and 14 tells us what our purpose and our responsibility is. It is man's all to fear God and to keep His commandments. That's all we have to do in this life to have an eternal home with Him. Reverence Him and keep His commandments. Man was created for a purpose and he was given responsibilities in this life. When we look at the Matthew chapter 25, we know that in the first 13 verses, there were some bridesmaids that were taking care of the bride until the bridegroom came for her. And as the bridegroom was coming, the, bridegroom, the bridesmaid went out to uh, accompany him in. Ten of them, according to Matthew 25. And they were waiting, five of them foolishly and five of them wisely. For the bridegroom to come. And when we look at chapter uh, 25 verses 14 through 30, we see the story is repeated using talents. All of the men were given talents to reproduce until the master came home again. And then we can see in the last verses 31 through 46, the understanding of the judgment for those who were foolish was what was given to them. We understand that they did not know what their purpose in life was and what their personal responsibilities were. They were ignorant of these facts. We exist to prove our love and worthiness to God and to care for His Son's bride, the Church of Christ, for which He shed His blood on Calvary's cross and died for our sins. That's the reason for our existence. Faithfulness. The testing of our faithfulness or the failure of that endeavor. Either way we will be judged. It will determine our soul's eternity. That was verse 14 of Ecclesiastes 12 and 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. For God will bring every work into judgment including every secret thing whether good or evil. Each and every one of us is responsible for these things. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 We know it's been told to us twice that we're responsible for the things that we do. You know, we have a number of, of responsibilities in our life in many, many areas. We're going to talk about some important ones this morning, starting with our responsibility to God. Fear God and keep His commandments. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. 
So here, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. There it is in one line. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. It's not that hard to do, but we must do it. Faith in Him is absolutely necessary. It is one of our responsibilities to have faith in Him. Acts 17, verse 28, For if we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. As His offspring, we must have faith in Him. We must love Him and we must keep His commandments. We must also be seeking Him daily in our lives, not just once in a while or once a week, but daily. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each of us. Acts 17, verse 27. One of our purposes is to seek the Lord. But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. We must seek Him and we must know Him and know what He has for us to do. You know, departing from evil and doing good are things that we should do. That's what He would have us do. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and His ears are open to their cry and the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Psalm 34, verses 15 and 16. You know, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. 1 John 1, verse 6. It should be obvious to us that we do not fear God if we daily embrace evil and sin in our personal lives and in our church lives. Not only can members of the church see your sin and your belief, but so can everyone else in the world. You demonstrate daily whether or not you are, have the responsibility of pleasing God, whether or not you're doing that. We have to love God. It's one of the things that's required of us to love God. And Jesus said unto them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Can we not keep the first commandment? Love God? Do what He would have us do? God desires and commands us to love Him totally and completely with all of our strength and with all of our mind. You know, love equals reverence and adoration from the heart. Reverent fear of God. That's what we need to have. Not with rote actions, just coming to church and worshiping and going home and not remembering why you were even here or what you heard while you were here or what you did while you were here. It is in devoted service to Him and to Him alone. That's where your love is expressed on a daily basis. Our love for God should imitate the love that He has for us. How much love did He have for us? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3 verse 16. There are those who have changed that to would not perish. But you will perish if you do not love God. So it should not perish. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that perfect will of God is that you love Him as He has commanded you to do. We have to obey God. 
That's what we learned in our text, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for that's man's all. Keep His commandments. In 1 John 3, verse 5, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. They're not hard to keep. Why people won't do it, I have no idea. I have no clue. You know, your salvation depends upon it. Hebrews 5, verse 9. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who will obey. Not to those who will not obey. The Lord wants us to obey his will, and his will is not hard to do. You know, there are many people out there who would rather obey a man. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Acts 5 verse 29. Why would man want to not worship God? I don't know. You know, when we worship God, we need to exalt Him. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His footstool. He is holy. That's Psalms 99 verse 5. And it tells us in Matthew 4 verse 10, And worship, and Jesus said unto them, Away from you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. We need to worship the Lord as He has required us to do. It's not that hard. John 4, verses 23 and 24. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You know, we said earlier that we must be seeking God. Notice also that the Father is seeking us to worship Him. So we have that responsibility to God. We also have a responsibility to His Son, Jesus Christ. We must believe that He is the Christ, that He is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah, our Savior, that He died on Calvary's cross for our sins. In John 3, verse 36, He gives us that everlasting life that we're looking for. Only through Him will we have that everlasting life. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God will abide upon him. Either you believe or you don't believe. If you don't believe, the wrath of God will abide upon you and you will be lost in eternity. John 8, 24 says that we should not die in our sins. Therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. It's very important that we believe who Jesus Christ is and what He did. He did all the things that He did so that we may have life. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing that you may have life in His name. What we have to do is keep His commandments. That's all God asks us to do. In John 14, verse 15, in John 15, verse 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. How much clearer can it be what each and every one of us needs to do? Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. There's that word again, commanded. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the ages. So we do have a true responsibility for Christ. 
We must be subject to His rules, His commandments, the law of liberty that He has given us. It tells us in First uh, Colossians, in Colossians eight, uh, one verse eighteen. I keep wanting to say First Colossians, but it's not the case. Colossians one verse eighteen. He is the head of the body. He is in charge of each and every one of us. He determines whether or not we will live with Him eternally. And that's based on whether or not we keep His commandments. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in all things He may have preeminence. We need to remember that Christ lives in us, each and every one of us. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2 verse 20. Why can we not keep his commandments? He died for us. He died a horrible death for each and every one of us. We need to live for him. And he died for all, and those who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 15. Christ died for us. And we want to deny our responsibility to him? No way. We can't do that, not and have eternal life with him. We also have a responsibility to the church, the body of Christ. That is us as members. We need to attend the services. It tells us in Hebrews 10 verses 24 and 25 for us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Why do we need to assemble? To stir up love and good works among ourselves. There are several commands to worship that involve assembling together. We just partook of the Lord's Supper. That's one of them. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's why we do it here. So we can proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now on the first day of the week. When? The first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. Paul ready to depart the next day spoke unto them and continued his message until midnight. Acts 20 verse 7. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 13. Therefore my brethren when you come together to eat wait for one another. We need to assemble to partake of the Lord's Supper. We need to assemble to stir up love and good works in, in one another. And we also need to assemble to sing praises to the Lord. Ephesians 5 verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Seeking, singing and making melody in your hearts unto the Lord. How can you do that if you're not assembled together? We have a responsibility to the church to do that. We also have a responsibility to support the church with our money. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collecting when I come. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. We need to help support this congregation and to do good works for the Lord. It tells us in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7, that we give as we have purposed in our hearts. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will reap reap bountifully so let each one of you give as he has purposed in his heart not grudgingly or of necessity for God loves a cheerful giver 
We need to be involved in the activities that are a part of this church. And there are many activities such as the ladies sewing and ladies Bible class, visiting the sick. There are a lot of things that we can do and be involved. Some of the acts, uh, or some of the people here act like they're not a part of the church. They like to just show up like a visitor and do nothing, warm the pew. Maybe they need something, so they'll come in a personal time of need. Or maybe it's Christmas or Easter and they feel like they need to go worship. We're not to have that attitude. Not if we love the Lord. We are to assemble weekly. We have a responsibility to the church and to the church members to edify each other. We are a part of the body. It tells us in uh, Ephesians 4 verse 16, that every part of the body does something. From whom the whole body, joint and knit together, by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. If we're ever going to grow, we're going to have to work together. We're going to have to be joined at the hip and knitted together and supply the things that are necessary for the effective working of this congregation. You want to see growth? Work together. Work together as a body. That's what the Lord's trying to tell us in our responsibility to the church. We also have responsibility to our families, our children. We need to rear them in the nature of the Lord. We, know we, need, we need that uh, fathers need to take care and take the lead and help raise these children as they should be raised. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Nurture them in the manner in which they need to be nurtured so that they can grow up and be godly people. Mothers also are involved. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, I am persuaded it is in you also. That's what Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 verse 5. Husbands and wives, they need to be loving and faithful lifetime mates. Working for the Lord together as a team. Hebrews 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Hebrews 13, verse 4. There is no room for divorce among husbands and wife. And I say unto you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. And whosoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Matthew 19, verse 9. We were intended by the Lord to be together our, all of our lives when we join each other in marriage. Ephesians 5, verse 22 through 29 says we have a mutual love. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it just as the Lord does His church. Not only do you have a responsibility to the church, but you have a responsibility to yourself. You also are responsible for the things that you do. You must hear, and you must receive the gospel. It tells us in Matthew 7, verses 24 through 30, 27, that we must be hearers and we must be doers. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Matthew 7, verse 24. Must be a hearer and a doer to be considered a wise man. The gospel teaches us that the Bible uh, tells us we're saved in Christ. Only in Christ do we have salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received and by in which you stand, 
by which you also are saved, if you hold fast to that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Did you truly believe the word of God when you were baptized? That's the question involved in that statement. We must hear the word of God. We must believe it. John 8, 24, we must repent of our sins. Luke 13, verse 3, we must also confess our sins. Romans 10, verse 9, we must confess that Jesus is the Son of God. And we must be baptized for the remission of those sins. Mark 16, verse 16. That's part of our responsibility to ourselves. We must also keep walking in the way of the Lord once we are baptized for the remission of our sins. We must obey and we must work out our own salvation. 1 Timothy 4 verse 16. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this you will save both yourselves and those who hear you. Bringing other people with you to Christ through your own actions. Continue to examine yourself and test yourself with the scriptures. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? Surely you do know he's there. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. These are responsibilities to ourselves to test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from what is evil. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22. Test all things. Walk worthily daily in your daily life. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling in which you were called. Ephesians 4, verse 1. And then be faithful for the remainder of your lives. Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulations ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Revelation 2, verse 10. Faithfulness is hard to do for many, many people. Very hard. You've heard the word of God. You know what the invitation is. You know what's required of you. You know what the commandments are. The thing is, the invitation is up to you. Jesus is calling you. If you've not been baptized or you need to repent of your sins, now is the time while we stand and sing.